Hello, this is Pink Leather and Lace, and today, let's talk about hot boys. Every now and then, we will come across a film, and we see that it's won awards, and then we will read the summary and we'll be like, you know what, that sounds like a good movie. I will watch it someday. And then weeks pass. Then you come across the film again and you'll be like, Oh, definitely, definitely gonna watch this someday. Then more time passes and you meet someone. His name will be something like Elijah. And he will tell you how much the film has changed his life. And you tell him, yes, yes, I've heard about that film. I will definitely watch it. And then months pass and you keep saying, one day, one day, one day I will watch this film. Well, guess what? That day has come. Go grab your popcorn because today we're watching Pride. Pride, a movie with a title so bland they could have just called it gay. It's a film based on the real story of how a group of gays and lesbians in the UK formed an unlikely alliance with minors who were on strike in the 1980s. This is a film which I don't know if it's the hugely ambiguous title or the political content that never really achieved a huge audience even among gay viewers. Yet those who have seen it will swear on their next grinder date on how good the film is. But is it? Let's find out as we take a look at Pride. So Pride opens at a Pride parade. Clever? Well, actually, it starts off before the parade as we see one of our main characters, Mark, played by Ben Schnetzer, get ready for the march. I told you we were talking about hot boys. He is watching a documentary on the minor strike while a banner bearing Thatcher out waves outside his window. Ah, Margaret Thatcher. Ironically, still not the worst leader in British history. Take your pick. Then we see Bromley, the other major character in the film, played by George Mackay. He is young, still in the closet, and wants to join the march, but he is nervous. Disgusting. Yes. <laughs> then the Pride March, there's homophobia because, well, because it's 1980s London. I don't care for how higgledy-piggledy it all is now. Although it is lovely they don't herd us into police vans and throw us into prison anymore. The parade is over, then they have a meeting where they talk about supporting the miners because the Thatcher government has finally found someone new to abuse. They, of course, do this in a bookshop owned by Geffen, who... Wait a second. Is that Andrew Scott? It is! This now counts as the second gayest role he portrayed. So Moriarty has a boyfriend who, surprisingly, is not Sherlock, but is Jonathan Blake, played by Dominic West. Not to mention the other members of the group. So many pretty boys. British boys are ha. So they form LGSM, Lesbians and Gays Support the Miners, and they start collecting money on the streets. And while they were facing difficulty collecting from straight people, they also faced difficulty from the gay community who thought it silly why they were collecting money for minors when the LGBT community was also faced with issues, charges of indecency, the rise of AIDS. Nonetheless, they do raise a substantial amount and then they run into another problem. No union or organization is willing to accept their donation. Now, if you think that this is just a case of minor homophobia, <laughs> let's put it in context. When the miners were on strike, they weren't working and the only income they could have had was from the union. As the strike drudged on, the small amount could not have been enough to sustain their families causing some miners to actually leave the strike. 
So groups who were raising money were not just doing this to show solidarity, but the money was sorely needed by these families. So to reject money from LGSM is really a slap in the face. It's saying that they would rather starve than publicly ally with the gays. Eventually, they decide to just donate the money to a small town in South Wales called... I can't pronounce that. A representative from the town, Dai, comes, not knowing that the organization donating is actually a gay group. Truth told, you're the first gays I've ever met in my life. As far as you're aware. That's true. And you're the first minor I've ever met. He is initially taken aback, but he realizes the importance of an alliance and even ends up giving a speech at a gay club. Interesting, it is at this club that we hear this guy call Mark. Some of you know me, my name is Mark Ashton. And that's an interesting thing to point out. This film is based on real life and real people. Mark Asher was real and was in fact a communist and a member of the Communist Party. And in fact, the ideologies he has, especially with creating LGSM, is rooted in leftist class struggle. A thing that the film very conveniently forgets to mention because, you know, communism is a bad word? Again, complete and utter bollocks! We now move to the town where there's a meeting if they should invite... Oh, hold on, hold on. Is that Professor Umbridge? It's really hard for me to believe Professor Umbridge would support civil disobedience. Okay, wait a second. We're supposed to root for the side that has Umbridge and Moriarty in it? Who's on the other side again? I can't change my style. It has to be a style of firm leadership. Well, isn't here to be a softie. Oh, right. Back to the town hall where you have Umbridge, <sighs> Hefina, the politician Sean James, and Maureen, your token homophobe for the movie. They agree to invite LGSM to the village, and we finally have our fish out of water story, where the city bred London lads stand awkwardly among the country folk. It goes, yeah, as well as you would imagine. People don't seem to like it, and some of them even walk out. The gays do eventually earn the trust of the village. Because raising money wasn't enough. By telling Sean James that the police cannot illegally detain people, they get asked the usual questions. I was talking of lesbians really did shock me. That can't be true, can it? You're all vegetarians. You live together like, you know, husband and wife, but what I want to know is... I know what you're going to say. Which one does the house work? They do a disco, everyone's happy. They keep this up for quite a while. On one of the visits, the lesbians of the group try to lobby for the creation of a woman's only club, only to be shot down by Mark. This is one of the film's flaws. The creation of lesbians against pit closures is an important discussion because generally speaking, LGBT groups tend to be dominated by cisgendered men and the film simply glosses over it as women being emotional. I just everything gets so aggressive with you lot. More inspirational speeches punctuated by political songs as the group decides to do something big. At this time, Maureen, you remember, the token homophobe, wants to do something about the gays in town and sells the story to the press. This means that the miners face more jeering at protest while LGSM gets attacked. This, however, becomes the springboard for the group to host a charity concert called Pits and Perverts to raise more funds and awareness. I wanted to lick your pits. I got a thing about pits. Of course, planning a concert is never an easy feat. It was a struggle to get performers. While over the village, people have decided to take a vote in a few days on whether or not they would continue to accept support from the group. Eventually, the concert pushes through. This time, the mining community goes to London. That's, you know, the reverse fish out of water. 
and we see. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we not here either. Oh. We're minus. Well, that's hot. That's also hot. That's really hot. That's kind of funny. That's rather lesbian. And that's an image to keep in mind the next time Umbridge pisses you off. Unfortunately, when tragedy strikes, it strikes multiple times, and we know the film's reaching its climax. Bromley, the youngest one of the group, gets grounded when his parents realize he's gay and is a member of LGSM. Mark found out that he may be HIV positive and the union takes a negative vote before most of the villagers who were on the site and were at the charity concert in London had time to return, therefore invalidating any future help from LGSM. The group splinters off with Mark deciding to find himself. Geffen decides to collect by his own. Like, what the fuck? First row of the group, comrade. Nobody collects alone. One of the miners, Cliff, comes out as gay. I normally hate coming out scenes as they can be trite, but this was genuinely well done. And we get to the sad part. The UK miners strike did not have a happy ending. And this is something the film had to contend with. The miners go back to work. Bromley runs off to see them. He and Mark have a talk about gay lib. Sean drives him home where they visit Geffen in the hospital where he reveals that Jonathan has AIDS. Jonathan convinces Sean to pursue higher education. Sean drives Bromley home. Yada, yada, yada. Homophobic parents. Bromley runs away. Let's wrap this up. Pride ends as it began at the parade. Mark goes back to the group. They go to the march. And then this. People have become tired of politics and that this year the tone should be celebratory with affirmative slogans and a positive atmosphere. Oh, if you insist on marching with your banner, you'll have to march at the back with the fringe no, groups. Mate, mate, we're LGS, we fall alongside the miners. Congratulations, but now it's time for a party. Okay, BS. Pride has always been political and has always been rooted in grassroots struggle. Pride may seem to be a party, but it's more than that. It's protest. It's a fuck you to the system. And that is the reason why when I attend a pride parade, I would rather hold a political slogan rather than hold a happy banner. So anyway, surprise, surprise, the miners come to the march. Where are my lesbians? <laughs> I would love to have lesbian summoning powers. Okay, full disclosure. I've seen this movie at least three times before deciding to review it, and I just gotta say... The ending. That ending. That goddamn ending. It makes me tear up every time. It's not just the miners they befriended who came, but all the miners from all the lodges of the NUM. And that scene with the buses and the slogan and Maureen's son and the reporters and the police... That always does it for me. The music is manipulative, yes, but goddammit, it is a great scene and it is the best way to cap off this terrific movie. It was a brilliant film. Even the way it subverts its own tropes as mentioned with the coming out scene or the whole let's ask gay men questions, a lot of these tropes the movie is aware of and is actively subversive. Does the movie have flaws? Quite a few. One, again this brings in mind the Indian film Three Idiots. Films such as these tend to be beautiful and grand and epic. Not just in writing but in cinematography, in score. And yes, you get spellbound. But does that fit into the narrative? The UK minor strike was not beautiful. Sorry, Thatcher's policies that led to the minor strike were not beautiful. It devastated communities. It caused mass panic and mass hysteria, not just in mining communities and villages, but across London and across the entire United Kingdom. I would actually argue that the film is too beautiful. Very little do we see of miners protesting. And why is this important? Because the UK miners strikes were not bloodless. People were hurt, mostly protesters injured by policemen. 
People were thrown into jail for misdemeanor. People were killed. The film, on the other hand, they have parties. They're always jolly. Everything is bright. They sing about being activists and you want to feel sad, but but I don't. I don't feel the despair. There's a disjoint somewhere. Extend this further. We don't talk about communism. We don't talk about race relations. In fact, the contentious verse in Bread and Roses about rising of the race was cut. We barely discuss women's rights. We don't even have a look at the National Union of Miners, who, by the way, was also divisive about whether or not the strike should take place, including the lack of a national ballot. Second, okay, let's talk about Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher is obviously the villain, and perhaps rightfully so. But, and I kid you not, I surveyed the people I know who watched this film with one simple question. What did Thatcher do to cause the protest? Did she close the mines? Did she open more mines? Did she increase taxes? Did she decrease exports? Did she ban disco? What did she do? There is very little discussion of Thatcher's policies. In order to do justice to the fight, we need to do justice to Thatcher. Yes, her policies were inhuman, but they did come from somewhere. I felt like everyone in the film is generally anti-Thatcher, and that really diminishes the anti-Thatcher block. Because if you don't know who the opposition is, then how can you define who you are and what your struggles are? We talk a lot about the historical aspect of the film, and it is important to do so. The 1984 UK miners' strike is important to discuss and it is never as simple, never as easy that it can simply be summed up. But let's move out of context and let's talk about the film and let's talk about what it gets right. Homophobia. It really gets this down. The idea that homophobia is systemic and is never just about one person being mean. Homophobia is something that was normalized among the population by the state, by Thatcher's policies, by the police. And even the film's biggest homophobe in Maureen can be sympathetic. You can see the struggle and it is very human. Number two, the intersectionality of gender and class struggles. What's the point of supporting gay rights, but nobody else's rights, you know? Or workers' rights, but not women's rights. It's, I don't know, illogical. Yes, it doesn't really make sense to advocate for gender rights, but believe in the oppression of workers, of people of color, of persons with disability. It's really all connected, and one can never be truly free from gender struggle if they are still caught in the class race restrictions. And finally, solidarity. Yes, solidarity. I genuinely believe in the friendship between this group of lesbians and gays from London and this little town of miners in South Wales. It was more than just a fish out of water story. It was a story about two cultures sharing, giving, protecting, and just being there for one another. Solidarity forever. Pride is a brilliant film. But in order to fully understand and nuance it, you may need to watch documentaries on the UK miners' strike, which on its own is worth it. But as a film in itself, and even given historical context, you know what? It's still solidly made. It's gorgeous. Everything about it is top-notch. The writing, the pacing, the acting. My God, the acting. This is some of the best ensemble work I've ever seen. No one falters and everyone pulls their weight. Given the amount of characters, everyone has their own backstory, everyone has their own motivations, and they're all juggled well. There's so many subplots that we didn't even have time to talk about, like Geffen's mom, the whole thing with Steph, Sean and her husband's relationship. They were all given justice. What else? The cinematography. The cinematography is grand. The music, the scoring was perfect. It's beautiful. They used a lot of songs from protest like Solidarity, Bread and Roses, Power of the Union, and it really worked. Every woman is a lesbian at heart. Every
every woman is a lesbian at heart. For the most part. But seriously, there is very little to hate in this film. I can guarantee you will love it. Unless you're a diehard Margaret Thatcher fan. And if you are, then fuck you. This is pink leather and lace. Now go and get laid. Complete and utter bollocks!